Leonard Slotkin, conductor of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, welcome to Cultural Attaché. Nice to be here. Good to see you. So we are here to talk about Rhapsody in Blue, uh, which celebrates its 100th anniversary on February 12th. And I believe your first recording of it was 1974, was it not? Actually, it's my only recording of it. Yeah. Uh, and it was indeed 74. Uh, however, my father recorded it well before that, back in the late 50s with Leonard Penario and the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra. What was your first exposure to Rhapsody in Blue? And what do you remember about that experience? You know, actually, it's so long ago, I don't think I remember. But I suspect that like everybody else, the first thing was the clarinet at the beginning, more than the piano part. It was a sound that we really hadn't heard before. Now, growing up in a house full of musicians and being around the studios and all that, yeah, I knew about Glissandi, but not one that was that long, preceded by a trill, going up that high. So I'm going to guess easily that that was the first sound. I knew jazz quite well as a kid, uh, hung out with a lot of jazz musicians, but this wasn't like anything else that I'd experienced. I didn't know so much about big band jazz as a youngster. I knew mostly about smaller combos, uh, particularly on the West Coast. So this idea that whether it appeared in a symphonic form or in a band version didn't really strike me as anything other than something very unusual that I wasn't used to. You know, this has become one of the most beloved pieces of, of all of American music. Why do you think this piece resonates as strongly as it does today, a hundred years after it was first, you know, performed in New York. That is the question, of course. And I think in order to understand that, we have to go back to that first performance and understand why it was so important. So we didn't really have American music for the concert hall. Yes, there were composers in America, and yes, many of them were born in the States, but the sound of the music itself reflected a more European tradition based. So whether we're talking about composers like Arthur Foote or George Chadwick, whoever it was before the turn of the 20th century, or we're even going into the 20th century with people like Ives and Ruggles and Rieger, we're not talking about an original American music. We're ta talking about borrowed music from church, from patriotic songs, from folk music. We didn't have anything we could call our own. That was coming up via the emerging popular music scene, probably starting with ragtime. And so now 1924 comes. This concert is organized by Paul Whiteman, an experiment in modern music. Uh, and until then, the vernacular music of the time tended to be shorter pieces, three, four minutes long. Now, all of a sudden, a large scale work, 15, 16 minutes was appearing. And I never call it a jazz piece. It's really more taking the popular music of the time and inflecting it into a real concert hall, the Aeolian Hall. This audience, which included some of the most distinguished musicians in New York at the time, was stunned by what they heard. Although the French had already been putting this kind of music into their system with people like uh, Mio and others who were interested in American culture that had arrived in Paris to study with these classical masters. So the concert happens, it's an immediate sensation, and all of a sudden composers in this country said, aha, we have the room to grow within our own culture, within our own sound world. And from that point on, Composers now began to feel they could gravitate from one world into the other, whether it was so-called classical music composers writing for jazz groups or using jazz rhythms, popular rhythms, or the other way around. And I think that's what retains its appeal in the Rhapsody in Blue, the fact that it still reminds us that there was something original and unique about it. Yes, it has one of the great all-time melodies ever, uh, starting about two thirds of the way through. And it has these infectious sounds and rhythms. It remains unlike any other piece, including those that were also by Gershwin. It's the second Rhapsody is quite a different piece. Uh, the concerto in F, of course, and the two shorter pieces for piano and orchestra 
there's nothing like the rest blue and i think that's what remains today that we simply can't compare it to anything else how much do you think the credit for rhapsody in blue should go to Ferdy grofay well a lot of it because he helped arrange it both for the whiteman band and in the orchestra versions so we do have those colorations from grofay uh, but the structure of the piece that's all gershwin and the piano part is clearly all gershwin and clearly Gershwin had in mind some of the ideas that he wanted to present. He didn't study orchestration and wasn't trained as a classical composer at all. But as we can witness with works like the Cuban Overture, American in Paris, the Concerto in F, which would follow, these were works that he did orchestrate. And so he clearly understood what the orchestra could and could not do, even at this early age. So it's hard to imagine that Whiteman didn't have a lot of feedback and input from Gershwin himself. But Grofe is the one who helped put it on the map, at least in the orchestral guise. Well, it's my understanding, if I remember the history um, correctly, that Gershwin was very delinquent in getting started on this. And frankly, yeah. it was the deadline that made him finish this piece, wasn't it? I mean, there wasn't yes. necessarily time to orchestrate. No, and you had people like Grofe and so many others who were master orchestrators and they could turn these things around in 15 20 minutes just take the score in piano version and just knock out an orchestration they knew what to do but again i have a feeling and i've not looked at the original piano manuscript to see if gershwin had any annotations in terms of what he would like but clearly that opening with the clarinet must have been gershwin's idea or at least suggested to gershwin and then passed along to grofe i can't imagine any other instrument doing it I can't either. I can either, which makes it interesting when people choose to do variations on Rhapsody in Blue or revised yeah. versions of it. And I believe you were at the Hollywood Bowl this past summer with mm -hmm. an artist who does a very extended, elaborate version of Rhapsody in Blue. Why do you think this piece lends itself so much to other artists adding their own twists and turns on it? Well, even Gershwin himself added little things in different performances. I think one of the reasons that this works as an improvisatory piece, even though everything is written out by Gershwin, is because it's essentially a number of cadenzas where the orchestra is not playing. It starts out with a short one, then there's a slightly longer one, then there are two very big ones. There's a lot of times when the piano is all alone, it almost begs to say, as it would have happened in Mozart's time, that here, go ahead, I've written this, but go ahead and, and do something else. These versions that are uh, hybrids, that's a pretty good way of calling them that, uh, have existed for a long time. You can go back to recordings from the 1940s and hear versions where people are improvising at certain moments in the work. Uh, there are very few pianists that play it exactly like it's written, but the ones I've done, as you mentioned, this particular bowl performance uh, was with Makoto Ozone. It was fantastic. But you had to accept the idea that it was Gershwin slash Ozone. It was going to be a combination of the two coming together, finding a common ground. And I've done it this way with several artists. I always enjoy particularly what really talented jazz people bring to it. It's less interesting when a classical musician attempts to try to improvise their going into a field that they don't feel comfortable in. And yet somehow they do give it a try. Once in a while, a passage or two works. But the, for the most part, it feels like, oh, yeah, they're doing this and they're going to do it this way again. Jazz is not about that. Jazz is, as Shelley Mann, the great jazz drummer, put it, we only play things the same way once. Absolutely. Well, it's interesting because I did not know the history of variations on Rhapsody in Blue or improvisational components as part of it until I heard what Marcus Roberts did, yeah. which I thought was incredible because you're hearing harmonies and, and musical concepts that Gershwin could never have known because they came after him. Right. Only to realize that that Billy Strayhorn did an arrangement for Duke Ellington. Right. You know, Chick Corea did his own version, which was... done by a clarinetist named Barney DeGard was incredible. I and mean, there's just a lot of different versions of it that, that go on. And maybe that's another part that makes it timeless because you mentioned and said something about how audiences today still really gravitate to this piece, but so do musicians. 
uh, I know, interestingly enough, people who have literally zero background in this kind of music become fascinated with it. A few of my uh, Russian and Ukrainian friends who are pianists are really wanting to take it up, young ones. They're so fascinated by this particular piece. Yes, they want to reach an audience with it, and it is a worldwide work. It is not limited to the United States by any means. You put it on a program in Berlin or whatever, you're going to have a sold-out house. So obviously musicians from those cultures want to reach that audience as well. Now you you mentioned that this this was a work that you know incorporated you know American music of the time. You probably know that over the weekend, Ethan Iverson um, had an article published in the New York Times calling Rhapsody in Blue the worst masterpiece, um, faulting faulting the composition, I believe, for how it blocked other innovations for other artists, particularly you know black composers, in its wake. Does that well, seem like fair critical assessment yes. to you? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not. Because you know that Gershwin didn't intend that when he wrote it. That wasn't the, the means that I'm going to write something and therefore nobody else can go this direction ever again. No. Uh, I think it's not even fair to call this work a piece of cultural appropriation because it doesn't reflect what the Black musicians of the times were doing. They were going in a whole different direction. And yes, that music would pave the way for innovators such as Ellington and so many others. But Gershwin was in his own group. He came from Tin Pan Alley. Those are song pluggers. Those are people who went from door to door just pitching tunes to publishers. Would you take this on, publish it so it can be sold? Remember, everything back then, even though the recording industry had started and was doing okay, most music was sold in sheet music fashion for people to play at home. Within the black culture, that was probably not the case. This was passed on more through different means. And ragtime, as practiced, say, in New Orleans or other places, was mostly an improvisatory field. It wasn't really written out yet. Uh, so I found the article really probably exactly what he intended to get under your skin and i thought this just but for the wrong reason this just wasn't fair to gershwin or to the piece because it's embraced by everybody it's not felt as a work it's exclusive to one audience timeless works are that way for a reason because they go over these boundaries and the rhapsody in blue was different for its time Yes, could have, could Ellington and others have appeared and done this kind of work earlier if Gershwin hadn't done it? Eh, maybe, but probably not. And anyway, if they wanted to go that direction, they would have done it regardless of what Gershwin did. And Duke Ellington, for example, did go on and do absolutely. Know, I just other, one of his, other major his, compositions. Yeah, I did the Three Black Kings a couple of weeks ago. I've done Harlem. I've, there are the sacred services. There's all these pieces. Uh, and look how this tradition is carried on today with Wynton Marsalis, who really has become the voice of someone who is bridging these worlds, just like Gershwin did, but with his language, based from where? New Orleans. Right, absolutely. Now we- And New York. And New York. Yeah. Yeah, of course. We started this conversation with a discussion of the fact that you recorded this work in, night, the, in an album that was released in 1974. You know, that we're, like we're doing, we're what, we're 40, 50, 40, almost 50 years. 50, 50, absolutely. Yeah, 50, 50 exactly. Years. 50 years later, 50 years later, if you were to revisit this work and record it, how do you think that recording would differ from the one that you made 50 years ago? It would differ primarily from the point of view of the pianist. Uh, it uh, orchestrally, I mean, I've, I've certainly I've done it countless times, and I did it indeed a couple of weeks ago with the same pianist we recorded it with 50 years ago. We were the only two people on the same stage left from that time. So it was really a nostalgic moment. I suppose what would be different is I'm more informed by the structure of the work. I probably am a little more free with it in the orchestral passages that call for freedom. Most of them don't. Uh, I, I think it's important to remember that Gershwin 
1924 doesn't have swing at his disposal. This has not come in yet. We're still coming out of ragtime and these other popular elements. So perhaps these days I try to guide, say, the clarinet solo or the trumpet or the trombone, if they're not comfortable and not familiar with the sound and style, to little details. It might be a slight wah-wah sound from the trumpet, or it might be a different kind of additional note to put in with some of the players. If I had to record it again, though, I would probably do it in the smaller Grofe orchestration. Uh, I, I, I think the maybe four or five violins instead of 16, that kind of thing, give it a little more intimate feel something closer to what they might have heard at the Whiteman concert, but not necessarily in the style that it was played in the Whiteman time, because that really does depend on the pianist. Now, as a as a as a music historian, as as well as a as a conductor, what do you think Gershwin would would have to say if you were to just fantasize? What do you think Gershwin would have to say to know that a hundred years after this work debuted, that it was still embraced as much as it is? I think Gershwin would have no problem with it. <clears throat> And the reason is because he had already gone on after the Rhapsody in Blue to write other pieces that were equally acceptable to all audiences, whether it was American in Paris or Porgy and Bess, the shows, the films. Gershwin was all about moving forward with music. Uh, and unlike, well, a good example here would be Leonard Bernstein, who talked about how he really was not happy that so many people knew him for West Side Story only. Gershwin, I think, would have said, I'm thrilled that the Rhapsody has reached this kind of audience, and I'm pleased that my other works have also done this. You know, he's always the classic example, along with Mozart and Schubert, of saying, okay, what would have happened if he'd lived longer? But, you know, let's just take what we've got, because what we've got is not bad. It isn't, but uh, but boy, would I have loved to have heard what would have happened had he lived another 30, 40 years. Yeah, we all would have, but we don't have that. So as long as we don't, all these different versions of a Rhapsody in Blue or the Ellington, Louis Armstrong, Porgy and Bess renditions, things like that, they're so wonderful because they show how timeless this music is. It just is going to keep going on and... If I wasn't about to be 80 years old, I would love to hear what they're going to be doing with this 50 years from now. Well, maybe we'll get a chance to hear what you'll be doing. It Maybe you'll record it again. Stranger things have happened, right? Yeah, 50 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> at 130, he's still at it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>